in my Google password again. And we're live. Welcome back to another Corona Geek here where we talk all about mobile app development using Corona SDK. I'm your host, Charles McKeever. And today we're going to talk about flaming... We're going to talk about flaming motorized cars. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Did you... Motorized see what cars. Did you see what I put on Twitter? I mean, not Twitter, on uh, Facebook. Sir, sir? You see what I said? I said on Facebook. I said I said we were going to talk about flaming motorized uh, wheeled carts of death, and we're gonna, we, we, that we would create using toothpicks and physics. <laughs> oh man, people are going to be disappointed then. There's no <laughs> flames or toothpicks. I may have oversold it just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, joining us on the panel today is uh, Ed Marina from RoamingGamer.com. Hey yo. Jason Schroeder from jasonschroeder.com. Hello. And Sergey from spiralcodestudio.com. Hi. Yeah. So, so Sergey, before the show started, you said you went on a trip here recently. What was it about? And yes, I've Jason been to Stevens. Moscow, uh, and I participated as a speaker on another developers conference. And I was uh, there with my master class about developing uh, quickly a mobile game from scratch. And uh, it turned out to be quite fun. I liked it. Uh, listeners liked it a lot. And I have a link for this. So anyone can download it and play. Uh, it's hosted on my Dropbox. So uh, I submitted the link to the chat. And we can. Have, I don't know, maybe a QR code somewhere or something. Okay, yeah, definitely put a link in the show notes so people can download it. Uh, you gonna leave it there indefinitely or just you know just for a period of time? Yeah. Not sure yet. Okay, maybe move it around or something. If you move it around, let me know. I'll just update the link in the show notes. Sure, sure. Cool. And, and so well, you guys... I'll load it, play it, uh, and have fun. Oh, actually, I have another link to my GitHub. So, yeah, it's uh, quite... Um, you can download it and build for yourself to play it uh, on the on the current simulators. Oh, okay. So you guys published the code then. That's cool. That's fine. Was it was it a big event? How many people were there? Uh, about five hundred. Oh, that's a good size. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Sure. And as a link to the chat. Okay. All right, I'll put that in the link in the show notes as well. So you can go down, anyone can go download the code and play with it. Are, is this a game that you're going to publish in the store? Not sure yet. Maybe I'll make a tutorial on it. Yeah. So right now it's just for uh, just for the yeah. event, just for funsies? Yeah, just just for fun. You know, making uh, something small and this is uh, just the gameplay itself is fun, but when you try to make it wrap around to actual game and Publish on the store. It takes so much time, so much effort. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Screenshots alone take a uh, take hours. That's one of the topics I want to get to at some point. Is uh, workflow. You know, creating screenshots and doing all that kind of stuff. Just any tips for speeding it up would be great. I'm sorry, I got excited when you said that. <laughs> I read I read an article. Uh, I was looking. I asked myself this question. I wonder if there's somebody always posts a list of ten things you gotta do or five things you must do for your app. And I said, I wonder if somebody's posted a list of the top five things or ten things that every app developer should have in their app. Like, uh, should we all use uh, social buttons or should we all do uh, uh, like leaderboards? And so I'm just curious. And then I saw this list. It said 46 things you have to do before you publish your app. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that is so true. Because I looked at the list, and I'm like. Oh my God! You're right. The list has gotten huge. <laughs> it goes through all the like the publishing steps and go make the screenshot and do the icon, and do the description, and then if you want to put it into another country, you got to convert it over into the language. And like, oh my gosh! This list is. It used to be like five things, yeah. right? Today it's it's huge. So me talking a lot, but yes, we should talk about workflow sometime. Oh, that's well, going to be a whole show. It's a good point though, because uh, like you say, I mean. You think once you've made the app, it's, you're done. You're like, oh wow, no, no, buy. I mean, that's almost, that's almost the easy part. <laughs> <laughs> it is almost making the game is actually not the hard part anymore. Yeah. 
It's at least more fun than the publishing. Publishing's a drag. Hey, so Sergey, was this? Uh, you said this was like, was this like a game jam or something? I mean, five hundred people showing up. Is this like specifically? Was there, th- was there like a theme for the, the event, or how did it go? Mainly, it was a conference for developers who are mainly interested in web development, like websites, uh, high load uh, databases and stuff, and um, a few talks were on graphics there, and my. Only one, no, not only one. My was, uh, we had two talks on games. Okay, cool. Well, well it sounds like it sounds like it was fun. I'd, I'd love to go to those types of events, uh, just to see what other people are doing. And my Especially game uh, theme was, it was uh, totally uh, about social awareness. And it's uh, devoted to the garbage in the space, and my game is about cleaning garbage at space. And there's a lot of garbage in space orbiting our planet. Yes. I loaded it up real, really fast just now, uh, and it's got uh, the graphics are good. I like the music that you got going in it. It's cool. Yeah, it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you but grab? Uh, I, know, I know where to steal. <laughs> there's some good, there's some good open source stuff out there. I'm working on a game right now, and I found uh, yeah, it's open a source. site where this guy just, you know, makes these sort. Of, I mean, it's not going to be appropriate for every game, but you know, it's like a healthy chunk of of some loopable, some not music. It's just like, eh, I just use it. It's all good. Give me some credit if you want. The music I found on SoundCloud and uh, spreadsheets for the. Uh, pieces and for the uh, spaceship I found on Google and it was, yeah, it was open sourced. It was free to use. Most of the SoundCloud people you can reach out to and, you know, just have a conversation with them. I'm sure they'd be happy to give you some sort of, you know, like email confirmation that you can use their stuff. Yeah, I actually did it once and they were more than happy to provide the track for the game. Oh yeah, so Ed, you put this link in here about uh, what is it? In- Comp Tech. You're you're muted. I am muted. I was being so nice, quiet. I was trying to be quiet. Uh, you know, I should remember his name. Kevin McLeod. Kevin McLeod. He's got a yeah. whole ton of uh, good soundtracks and uh, you know stuff like that. Not sound yeah. effects, anything like that, but uh, soundtracks. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff that loops too. I mean, not just uh, you know, not not just annoying background music, but I mean things that are. You, you, just, you, I like but you know what I mean? Like, there's some some not not all pieces of music work, uh, and his typically do. Yeah, they do. And, yeah, so and he has it all broken up by category. Exclusively in my games maps. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, let's get into to today's topic. Oh, well, I'm installing yeah. the game now, so. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll put all these links in the show notes so that. Uh, all right, let me get this stuff out of the way here. I'm getting all distracted. See, Sergey, you distracted me. I well, blame Jason. What's this? I got what's this one here? No. Yeah, this is no it's this guy. It's one guy. It's just his website where it's you know uh, he has this weird sort of uh, control panel that I think is slightly arbitrary where you can pick and choose you know various themes or or emotions to sort of na- narrow his field of. Uh, free music, uh, and it's all sort of, you know, um, not EDM, but electronic, I mm-hmm. guess, mm-hmm. Um, but there's some really good tracks on there, I'm, I'm, I'm planning on using one and crediting him, and I haven't even reached out to him, frankly, I figure I will when it gets time to publish, just to let him know, but his terms are just sort of, yeah, you can just use it, you know, for commercial stuff, for free stuff, it doesn't matter, and, and some of his tracks are really good. Yeah, you know, I, I would imagine on some of that kind of stuff, it would be good to, to reach out to him, especially like uh, McLeod, you know, where he's uh, he's, a, he's very popular. A lot of people use this stuff, and, you know, if you could get him to mention... Yeah, I'm waiting until doing. it gets a little bit, you know, it's like one, it's like a back burner type of personal thing, and I'm hoping to, to have it ready maybe by the end of the summer, but it's not quite there yet, so I figure when I get a little closer, I'll maybe, you know, if he's got an audience, maybe he can help drum up some... some uh, Cross the city, I guess. Yeah. 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 All right, Ed. What you got? I got myself muted. Now I'm lost. Somebody is playing a game. I'm watching Sergey. 
<laughs> All right, so uh, where are we at? Before I get started on today's topic, I just wanted to um, let folks know that I'm changing the way I'm doing things a little bit, and it all starts here with the sampler. So um, as you know, if you've listened on the show before or uh, read any of my posts pretty much in the forums, I have a sampler that comes with SSK, and it's got a bunch of different examples. And I went through a lot of trouble to organize this. And for example, if you were to run this app, download it and run it, you could click on the little question mark in the upper right-hand corner. And you could read the help. And in the help, if you were to scroll down, it would say extracting sample code or SSK sampler code. And there's a video. And I, like I said, I went through a lot of trouble to organize this so that people could go in here and get the code out. And yet, people are still struggling to do this. For whatever reason, somebody told me that my video was too confusing. That's quite possible. Um, regardless, I have come to the realization that this is pretty but not easy for people to get into and take code out of and use. So I have started a new project that is not quite ready for release yet, but the premise is, is that it works a lot like the sampler. And what I'm going to try to do is answer what I consider to be interesting questions out of the forums and post answers to them in a unified sampler or project. And let me find it. So currently I'm calling it weekly answers to interesting forum questions. And let this thing spin through. And then it'll you run this. It, it'll be an app that you can download. And you'll run it. And there'll be a button to run the example or a button to, if you click on it, it will open up the forum link. It takes you to the forums where the question was asked. It's very, very basic application. Um, and the way this sampler will work is there will literally be folders where you can just copy the answer right out of this sampler, and then it will run. So the big problem with SSK, the sampler, was that Running the samples was dependent upon the harness, the 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 uh, menus, and all the stuff that were surrounding it. And it was too hard for people to get that code out. And so I'll explain. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning this now is not so much for a personal announcement, especially since this isn't quite ready. But I am now going to be doing the same thing for the Hangout. So I talk a lot. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I talk a lot. And um, last week, I realized two things. One. Uh, we don't cover topics uh, quickly enough sometimes, so we I overlap into another week, and that may be a little bit hard for people to consume. So I'm going to try to make things a little more bite-sized. And while I'm doing that, I thought, why not use this new sampler technique that I'm using for my own stuff? And where is it? Sorry. And so what we'll do is everything that I've already released will re remain out on the GitHub, but I'm going to start building up a unified sampler that will just have little bits of code in it that you can run out of the sampler simply by downloading it and clicking on the link or clicking on the button and they'll run just like this. However, let's say that you wanted to uh, extract this sample that I'm running right now. You'd simply run the sampler and say, oh, show 148, he talked about simple car Look at the parentheses. It says simple underbar car. That's the name of the folder. Then you open the sampler that you've downloaded. And you look in the folder examples. And you'll see that there is a folder called simple car. So you simply grab it. Just copy the whole thing. Paste it someplace else where you want to work on it. And now, instead of having it in this um, harness, you can simply... Go open the project, locate it, and all the files that you need, main Lua, uh, all the support files, all the images, everything else will be in there. And it runs exactly the same as it did in the harness. But now it's completely separated from the harness code, so you should have no confusion about what do I need, what does it rely upon, is there some kind of uh, uh, dependency between the the, the sampler code and the example, everything is self-contained now. That's super cool. Yeah, so so my, my one question, and this is, uh, 
This is a, this is a spoon-fed question. Is uh, would you ever consider breaking those? Go ahead and just breaking those samples out outside of the sampler. And so it's you know so instead of people having to go down and dig into the sampler. I, I project, had considered would... doing one more thing. Uh, let me go back to the sampler. Actually, let me go back to. So as my weekly sampler has a button here to run and a button to look at the question, I have considered doing sort of a similar layout. Let me go back to, where is it? Hangout sample. I got so many things. So instead of having just a button to run, I'm thinking about putting another button right next to it that says get it. Yeah. Which you could just click and it would give you a direct link to the GitHub uh, where there'd just be like a zip file you could download. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because um, uh, unfortunately some of these things depend on on people's understanding of a convention you know yeah. and if they don't understand the uh, the simple underbar car is the folder name then now they're lost right so they're like right. one one click away from where they should be but they don't know that because I'm gonna do something similar for my own the thing that I showed you just earlier where I was doing the weekly mm -hmm. there's more that's not quite done yet but there's gonna be some slight changes to the interface to make it easy for people to get that code so yeah. I'll probably do the same thing here uh, but the good thing is, is that um, not only will this be smaller and easier for people to consume, but it's all going to be in one place. I mean, unless we do like a game development sequence like we did previously, pretty yeah. much everything I talk about now will just go into this sampler kit, and you'll be able to find it. Well, that, yeah, that's nice. Ed, I have uh, two questions slash maybe suggestions. Uh, one, how are you going to handle updates with this? Is it going to be dynamically updated, like pulling from a... Uh, JSON file no, hosted I'm somewhere? I'm just going to tell people they need to download. So this is going to be uh, the whole sampler. Okay, let me back up. When I do talks on the Hangout, I always give Charles a link to a zip file. Mm -hmm. And the zip file contains the whole thing, whatever I talked about that day. And so from now on, I'm just going to give Charles the same link, and it's going to be to a zip file that people can download. And if they want to get the latest one, they just got to go download it again. So people will have to build this app themselves. You're not you're not planning on like releasing it on the App Store then. Oh no, I'm not going to release this on the App Store. Okay. Uh, and, and you know it's not really something they'd want to build and put on their device. And the reason is is because once I run, there's no way to like go back to the menu. Mm. The whole purpose of this sampler is really just to give people a very very simple way to look at an example in the simulator. Gotcha. Say, hey, I want to go look at rope joints. Oh, that, that's the kind of behavior I was looking for. Okay, let's see. Rope joint. Oh, it's in this folder. Or, oh, click the button, download the code. Done. Oh, see, because this is, and this is, and you might be totally right, but I'm if I can bend your ear, I almost think this might be worth releasing on the App Store, updating it dynamically so they don't need to download a new one, and then if you'd have to build a wrapper, you'd have to build a way to get back to the menu, but, and then I was thinking from it, because, you know, you can play with it on your device, which I think is just a easier way to sort of get how something looks and feels, and then maybe instead of saying, you know, here's the folder, maybe including a, a way that it would email you a download link, so that you're playing with it on your device, but then you can download, you know, direct download, like email myself the download link for this thing. No, 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 no just an idea. Yeah, no, it is. It's a good idea, with the exception of one little detail. <laughs> uh, iOS, Apple, mm -hmm. they don't allow you to do that. Pretty much, you've got to mm. be tricky about it. Yeah. They don't allow the word "sample," "demo," or anything like that. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The concept of samples. So I could do it for Android. So that's why I'm going to go with in the simulator first, and perhaps I can do an Android uh, release that people who have Android devices can do. But I'm almost 100% not going to do the Apple Store. I love it as a concept, so I think, I think it's really cool. And I do like the idea of centralizing everything, especially for Ed's uh, management, yeah. maintenance, you know, time. Right, well, this is just more efficient, and then I can find, like, if I make a mistake someplace and it's propagated through a bunch of things, I can just correct it in one place and be done. Another thing I just want to point out, you'll notice here, is uh, this one that says fake sample. Uh, for the most part, these are going to be what I call pure examples. That is, they don't require SSK, but not always. 
as I've stated before, the reason I made SSK was to make my life easier. So sometimes I'm going to be giving examples that rely upon, say, the SSK math library or something. And in those cases, the example will look just like the others. The button will look the same, except it will have a little label on it that says SSK Corona, which means that it requires SSK to run that example. So that's sort of like a little level up for people who are new and they may say, okay, that's cool, but I'm not sure I'm ready to delve into SSK quite yet. Okay. So. Yeah. What's interesting is, uh, you know, even um, even the Corona staff kind of running into this issue of sample apps, you know, keeping the sample apps uh, up to date, especially in the face of uh, re releasing desktop for, you know, for Windows and right. Mac. Because now all your scaling um, sample, you know, camp sample code, all the scaling is set for you know mobile devices, and now you're going to start introducing desktop devices, right? So, exactly. conversation becomes like, well, you know, what kind of sample apps do we need there, and how how are the previous sample apps going to be affected by you know this change and, and stuff like that? So I, I'm almost of the opinion that it would be great if we could move the sample apps out of the download and put just put them exclusively on GitHub or something, and then just link, you know, have a like, kind of like kind of like this, a sampler, I guess, if you will, where mm -hmm. you link to the repos on uh, online. That way, they're you know they're available to be maintained in one central place, but but people can kind of still get an index of them. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, well, that that's a good idea. I mean, you we have we as a community and the staff in general has a challenge in that users are not always able to find these things. Right. They don't even know they exist sometimes. Yeah, well, and, and, and yeah, and, and even uh, even though they're included in the download, some people don't even realize that the, that there's sample there's sample code in the download. I know. I mean, so it says right here samples, but a lot of people well, don't read them. They're like, yeah. "Oh." Well, no, and that's and that is relatively new. I mean, that's, you know, that hasn't always been around and that's one of the reasons why it is in the simulator now. It's like you know, there's docs and there's samples and there's forums, you know, you so know they here, here's some resources. This thing right here, need to go throb, throb, jiggle, 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 click me. Stop asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. So today we're talking about cars, and uh, we'll do that for sure. I've listed these other ones here as 148. I'm going to mention them because they're all simple, and people can just dig in. So distance joint, pulley joint, rope joint, and pivot. These samples are in the sampler now. I have mentioned them on show 148. That's today, right? So right. feel free to dig in. Whether or not we will treat these and examine them in the next half hour is not very likely. But they're very simple examples that you can simply take a look at on your own. The one I want to cover today, the one I enjoy, is the sample car, or the simple car, that is, which is nothing more than a box with two... Uh, Images that I have just taken. I've taken the Corona logo, and I've put a round body on them. And you know what? I realize that this is a little bit hard to see on my uh, screen. Is that coming through okay? Yeah, it's yeah. You small can see. for the hangout. It's it's kind of small, but it's. I mean, we, you could get the point. All right. So well, I, I was uh, struggling with uh, getting enough room to play around on, and yet mm -hmm. having the car be big enough for you to see what's going on. So in this example, as previously, uh, there are buttons to make the winds, uh, the wheel spin, and there is a button to control whether or not gravity is on. All right, let me take a look. I'm sorry, I have to bring up the code. So this code exists in the examples simple car folder which will have a download link later, <laughs> as suggested by you. Maybe not on this release, but in a future release, simply click the Get It Here or something button that's coming. But for now, you can look in Simple Car and open Main Lua. If I can manage to do that. There we are. And yeah, last time we talked about uh, turning this into a game. That, that's, that should definitely happen. Yeah. Since here, I've Just been looking at this for 52 days. I'm not sure why it says that, but the, the lower left-hand corner of my editor here, 52 yeah. days. That's not true. <laughs> um, all right, so um, 
as you can see here, it's formatted very much like a, a regular main Lua file. I mean, it's got uh, your the the various libraries that I'm requiring, physics. Uh, I've got a external module called Car Builder, which does all the work of building the car. I have another module called Ground Builder, whose job it is to draw this extremely beautiful platform. And I have another module called Easy Button that uh, encapsulates the code to turn images into very simple push or toggle buttons. And I'll show you this code. It's very, very simple. It's not robust, but it's accessible in the sense that even new programmers, new developers to Corona should be able to read this and understand what's going on and then quickly see that it isn't great code, but it is acceptable in this case. Um, the layout of this this whole file here, main Lua, is only 71 lines long, so it's a very short example that you should be able to uh, parse through. But besides the header, which is the uh, me doing the requires, what I do here at the top is I basically um, start physics. I set the gravity to zero zero because I don't want to have any gravity to start. I have an optional line on line 15. And by the way, you can read this. Yes. Okay. I see it looks okay in the um, yeah in the camera view there. So you can set hybrid mode if you wish. And let me do that just to show folks what it looks like. So let's relaunch. Uh, I'm on Windows, so I'm doing a Control R. But uh, I think it's Command R on OS 10 to relaunch or reload the simulator. And if you run this, you'll be doing that a lot if you make changes. So relaunch, click on Simple Car, and now we can see in hybrid mode, we can see the bodies, the outlines. These have turned green. They got that little um, axis alignment uh, thing here to show us the uh, x and y axes for these particular objects oriented. And then um, it's a little bit hard to see in this example, but you can see the car body and you can see the linkage between the joints and the car body. So let me turn that off again. And then after that, it's my preference generally um, when I call display new rect or display uh, new circle or new text or any of these builder functions that Corona supplies to create rectangles and circles and text, I prefer to pass in a display group as the first argument. And so in this example and in all future examples, typically the way I will produce these is I will create a display group. And let me back up. The reason I do this in the example for folks is because a lot of folks are going to go, OK, I had fun with this. I made some changes. Now I'm going to go put this in a composer scene. And so if I've already primed them by saying, here's a display group. You're going to, you need to pass that in. You're going to put all your objects in the display group. They're one step away from saying, all right, now I need to get the scene group from composer and pass that in. And it's just, you got to do that. Otherwise, your content won't be managed. And so. I've provided the examples in such a way that it's very easy to go from doing this to simply passing scene group in wherever it says group in the examples. So it, so it, rather than having to add all the individual items to the scene, they're just having yeah. that one group. Right. I mean, I see a lot of people do the, uh, they call the function to build it, and then they, they say group, colon, insert the object. Mm -hmm. and I don't understand why people do that. I mean, I guess it's straightforward because that's the way they're thinking, but... All builders take a first argument where you can just pass a display group in, and it automatically inserts it. And there used to be a reason why you'd want to do that or not want to do that, but today, with Graphics 2.0, the default behavior of automatic insertion is the one that most people want anyways. So there's nothing, there's no real, I can't think of a motivation to split it into two steps. I mean, I could think hypothetically, like I think, uh, you know, if you're building something where, let's say, a parameter of a, a secondary object, so it's dependent, let's say you've got two circles, and the one is, you know, 20 pixels in, in diameter, and you want the next one to, or, or it, you know, is based upon some sort of user input, so you want it to be scalable, <clears throat> 
and the second object needs to be bigger than that, but then it needs to be placed behind it. That would be a case maybe where you would, you know, after the fact need to right. insert yeah. it into the group. But that's fairly rare, and I'm totally with you. I think it's a, it's a, a great way to compress a composer scene is yeah, to eliminate all those extra layering. lines. Layering, I agree with you. Then they'd want to do it subsequently. But to me, if you're controlling layering, there's better ways to do it than the order of the insert. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I just I see it all the time, and then I always tell people, oh, you don't need to do that. Here, do this instead. I'm going to do that instead. Jason, maybe or, you're, I don't know, creating a radial timer or something? Well, exactly, something like that. So let's say you have, <laughs> well, I mean, in that case, where yeah. Where and then you want something that is dependent on some uh, property of the first one, so it can't be created first, even though it's layered beneath it. But I hear what you're saying. but I'm 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 stretching a little bit to come up with a hypothetical here. I think generally speaking, but here's the problem. I think you're facing and that I face when I try to give a description. I I say like yeah, I, you go into this explanation going yeah, I kind of understand why, but as you're explaining, you're going. Yeah, but I also understand that I could do this other thing instead, and that would be better. And what what was I just saying? <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem with, with knowing is like you know we know many different ways to do this, and then trying to explain to people is sometimes a challenge. No, but I think it is one of those things where um, once you realize, oh, this is a way for me to you know assign a group to a new object as I'm creating it. At the end, you know, if you're creating dozens of objects, you're eliminating potentially dozens of lines of code, of bulk from your file. It's right. uh, it's it's definitely uh, a good habit to establish. Well, and that, yeah, thing. and I know that when somebody goes and Google's Corona SDK, whatever it is they're trying to do, odds are Google is going to give them some outdated code just because uh, you know the SDK changes so quickly. You know, they're probably looking at a sample code from last year or the year before, and it's like, well, that you may not want to do it the exact same way that now. Right. Well, a lot. That's it. I think that's where a lot of people get it. Is they're looking at the old examples, and the old examples did it sort of longhand. Sure. Mm. But I wanted to point something out. I saw this in the forums, and this is why I always encourage people not to use the insert methodology. Was I saw a guy in the forums struggling with this problem where he couldn't figure out where, why his objects weren't being managed by composer. And uh, pretend, if you will, that line 23 to 27 here are all, all the function display new image rect. And he created a bunch of images, and he put them all in the same named variable. He called it ground or something like that. Mm. And then at the very end of his code, he said group insert ground, group insert ground. And he had the exact same number of inserts, but then I had to write him back and say, no, 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 no. Only the last one you made is getting inserted. All the other ones that were created before that. You have no way of referring to them. So it's, you know, people, they, they do this as a, um, what is it? Um, they don't understand what's going on. They're just doing things because they saw it. And so there's a disconnect between the understanding of how it works and what they're doing. And yeah. so many ways. Re re reproducing a pattern in the code, yeah. yeah. It's, not, it's not physical or mechanical. It's, some logic in there. All right, so I just wanted to say that this example, as I said, is very short, and it's got five sections to it. Section one, call the ground builder and create the ground. Section two, call the car builder, create the car. Section three, create three images, one for the gravity button, the button that we will use to toggle gravity on and off, one for the left movement button, one for the right movement button, and then step four, I define some very simple functions that do some work when you press the buttons, and in step five, I connect those functions to the images, and in a sense, effectively, Turn the buttons in, or turn the images into buttons that do something in the environment. For example, clicking this one will turn on gravity, or clicking it will turn it. Uh, if it's green, gravity is on. If it's white, gravity is off. Uh, clicking the left arrow will spin the left wheel and make it spin to the left, so the car moves left. 
Clicking the right button will spin the right wheel and make the car go to the right. So the code that we mostly want to focus on today, although I'll show it all, is the car code. And I'm thinking, having said that, that maybe I should get the simple code out of the way first. So let me take uh, people quickly through the easy button code so they can understand what's going on there. In the module, easy button Lua is a, I called it builder, I could have called it anything. Um, it's a simple module that has some functions in it. One of them is add touch, another one is easy push, and the third one here so far is easy toggle. Now add touch is basically a function that gives me the ability to add a touch listener to an object in one line of code. So instead of having to type this out every time and provide the code that goes in the listener or the callback, all I need to do is call add touch, pass in the object that I want to add the touch to, and call a function that needs to be called every time the person touches the object or releases the object. It's a very simple two-touch sort of button. So again, what happens is if you, if you pass in a function and you touch the object, what will occur is that function will be called and then when you lift your finger or the touch is ended, the function will be called again. And those are the only two times the function will be called. There's no moved. There's none of the other standard phases. So I've reduced this whole thing so that when you write, when I write examples, that I can keep them very, very short. And let's see, did I use that? Yes, I did. So an example of this was the left and right movement buttons. So if we look back up here, I basically created an arrow, two arrows, and find the example again. So this here is the left button and the right button, obviously. And they're just images at this point. At this point in the code, they're simply images. Then I wrote two functions. The on left function, which takes uh, the event from the, uh, the listener, and basically it says if the event phase is began, we set the left wheel speed to something. And if it is ended, we set the left wheel speed to zero. And I don't want to do anything in the case of moved or anything like that. So this way my event listener is very simple. It doesn't need to return a value. And the reason it doesn't need to return a value is because I use my easy button builder to attach that function to the left button. And so in this line here, we call easy button add touch. I pass in the left button image and this little function right here. And then what actually occurs is I attach a touch event listener to the object that was passed in, the left button. And I set it up to detect began phase and end phase. And it does a little bit of work here. If it's began, it sets the fill color for the object to green, as we saw. And if it is ended, it sets it back to white, the default fill. And the only other piece of work it does is it calls whatever function was passed as the second argument, and it passes it the event from the touch. And then what occurs then is as I touch it, that event comes in here. I check the phase. I set the wheel speed or if it's ended, I set it to zero. So uh, that's probably the most complicated of these. The push button is it's similar, but instead of doing work in began, it it's sets the color to green, or it sets it to white, just like the previous one. But it only calls the callback at the ended phase. So in other words, when I click on the object, and then when I release, the event that I want to occur, the listener, gets executed. So that, whereas with this button here, I have it executing on the begin and the end. In, if I have a case where I only want it to execute one time for the click, I use the easy push. Then there's one more case, which is the toggle button. So the gravity button, what we would like to be able to do, let me start this is we'd like gravity to start off. And then if I click this, I want the button to be in the on state. 
and I also want gravity to be on. However, I want to be able to click it again, and then the button is now reflecting that it is in the off state, but it is properly called the listener in such a way that it says, hey, undo what you just did, which was, in this case, to turn gravity off. So I achieved that first by creating a button called gravity B, which is just this arrow here rotated downward to give it the implication, some kind of implication that we're talking about gravity. So people have a, an association there that makes sense. At this point, it's just an image. The next thing I did was in step four, I wrote a little function that takes an event. And what it does is it checks to see if gravity is on. And the way it does that is it says get gravity which returns uh, x gravity value and a y gravity value, and I store them in gx, gy. And then it simply says, if gy is zero, that means I've set gravity to zero for the y dimension, which is all I care about in this example. If it's zero, set gravity to zero ten. Otherwise, assume that gravity was on and set it to zero zero. So this function, every time it's called, does nothing more than flip between gravity on, gravity off. It doesn't really care about the button at all. In fact, you see here, although the event is passed in, I'm not looking at the face. I'm totally ignoring it. And, and I just want to stress this. Uh, you'll see this a lot in the future, that I will have toggle functions, and they will do something like this. They will simply, the first time it's run, it will set something to be on. The next time it's run, it will set it to be off. It's completely disconnected from the button itself, which is why, although people can take the easy button example, it's not very robust. It's just easy to understand. It's the, uh, the Karate Kid pattern. You lost me on that. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax on, wax off. Wax off. So down at the bottom here, I use my easy button module, and I call easy toggle. I pass in a reference to the gravity button image, and a reference to the gravity function. And this listener basically says, OK, it checks in the began phase only, and it looks for a field called is toggle. Well, the first time this is called, that's not going to exist. So it's going to be, this statement will be true, because it says not is toggled which will be true if the field does not exist or if it is set to false, in either case. So I set it to true. I use the uh, underbar underbar nomenclature to make sure that future additions to Corona don't break this. I'm assuming that no, no time in the future will there be a new field on display objects called underbar underbar is toggled. And then I set the fill color to green. And I call the callback, whatever was passed in. Callback slash listener. We call them listener and Corona. I, I call them callback because of my background. It's just a function that's being called. The next time the user clicks that button, and the next time the phase is began, it will come in here. And because we set is toggled to true, not is toggled will be false. So it will skip this part and execute the next statement. It will set is toggle to false, set the color of the image to white, and call that function again. And because our function is really brain dead, it doesn't care about the phase. It's just a question of the number of times you call it is going to change it from on to off to on to off, not tracking the state of the button. The fact that the button is green is totally up to this touch handler. So. And go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm in a cheeky mood today. I was thinking you could change that to not object. What was it? What was it? Object dot underbar underbar. You could change it to not object underbar underbar is not toggled. No, double double <laughs> ne double make. That's right. No. The double knots, uh, the knot logic. That's what that's called. Well, I you know I say that because I I do seriously struggle sometimes with what to name something because you're like okay well the state of this and 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 there are conventions like you know is or has or things like that that you want to be able to use so that your code is consistent and then 
and then but there are situations where that doesn't make sense, right? So you 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 might actually wind up writing an if statement where it dumps to an uh, um, to a, a a result that does nothing, you know, just so that you can maintain this this uh, convention in your code. So. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to talk to what you said there, just briefly. So you you mentioned you made the suggestion of giving the name a negative connotation, like not set or not toggled. Right. And I would say to new programmers, this is what I was taught, is that is not a good idea, yes. no pun intended. Um, there's a thing called uh, not logic, which is uh, you go down this rabbit hole where the 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 um, most of us think in terms of something is true or something is false when we're talking about flags or we're talking about a toggle. But as soon as a flag is true if it's false, then your brain starts to get confused. Like right. It has to be said to false for the thing to be true. Then if you not not that, then you're like, is it true? Is it false? So you just avoid the whole not negative connotation. In other words, in short... Always set flags to have a positive name and a positive value is the on value. Never have uh, a flag where it has to be set to false or the name implies false for it to be quote unquote on or true. Right. It, it yeah. becomes too hard to track in the future. Unless you're playing tag and then not it is totally valid. <laughs> Boy, we're all cheeky today. Okay, so cheeky aside, <laughs> I'm going to look at the car builder because that's really the only one we really care about. Okay, so if we look at the car builder, um, we're going to see that there is my usual setup here. First of all, I required the physics library because I'm going to use it, and I stored it in a local called physics. I created a table called local builder, and I set just an empty table. And then what I do here from now on is whenever I want to add a function to that module, to this builder module, I say function builder dot name of the function arguments it takes. And in this case there's only a single function and that function is called create and its job is to create a square or a rectangle with two circular looking objects. These are actually rectangles but uh, they have a f- round physics body attached to them. And its job is to create those and then using joints, mount them together. And then it will add some functions to the chassis, which is the rectangle, that allow us to turn the wheels on or off, make them spin or stop spinning. And I'll step through this very briefly. All right, so at the top here, I have my magical filter which basically is this, we talked about this previously, it's the group index minus one. If I use this filter on all of these bodies as I create them, it's saying this body here, this body here, you can barely see my cursor, and none of them will hit each other, i.e. there will be no physics response, no bouncing, no touching, no friction between any of the body parts that I'm using to create the car. However, they will still hit anything else that is not using that filter setting, which is the ground does not use that filter setting. So we'll create the chassis first, which is the yellow bit. And we have some other variables here that we'll go back to in a moment. I don't think we need wheel speed. Just verify that. I'm sorry. There's a slight error in the uh, code there. Um, So we create the chassis first, uh, which is display new rect. And I pass in the group variable, or I'm sorry, the group reference, the display group. So immediately it will get inserted into the display group. And then I create a 80 pixel wide, 30 pixel tall uh, car. And if you don't like this, we can always make it bigger. So let's just do that for the example, not 600. And now when I run it, Will be <laughs> it will be much bigger with, with tiny tires. Okay, so there's our bigger car. It's now a clown car. All right. So then uh, I position the chassis. So you'll see that I passed in an x and a y value. I basically say place the center of this chassis wherever that x and y was. And you'll see that when we call this function, 
on line 23, I pass in the display group, and then I say, basically put my car in the center of the X dimension, content center X, and then content center Y, but then move it up, which is negative, 100, 100 pixels. 100 pixels above the center of the screen. So we position the chassis, because the wheel positions are relative to the position of the chassis. We'll calculate them. <clears throat> I set the fill color to yellow, which is 110 color code, just so that I can have something interesting to look at instead of having it all be white. Then I add a body to the chassis, and I give it some settings. I give it a low density setting, and the reason I did that was because I wanted it to be easy to move the... Uh, the, the car body. If I had made this density 1, actually let's run it first. Then I spin these wheels. Whoa! Okay, so it moves along pretty promptly. But then if I set this to 1 and ran it again, you'll see that there's already a problem that it's having an issue with the, um, the joint having trouble pushing the car back up. It's, it's supposed to maintain this position. You saw how it sank down. And then you can see that it's just totally misbehaving. So this is not a great implementation at this point of my, my car, my chassis. So let's put it back down to a lower density. You need some monster truck wheels. In fact, let's make it real small, 005. So it's practically no mass whatsoever. So just to be clear, Density, the mass of your vehicle is going to be basically the pixel dimension multiplied by the density. So because I made it uh, two times as wide and two times as tall, that made the mass uh, four times what it was previously. So I'd like my car to zip along. So I'm just going to make the density of the car itself, the, the body, the chassis, very, very low. And 0, 0, 005 is probably about as low as you can go before you get down to a rounding error where it rounds down to around zero. You never want to set your density to zero because that will cause issues for the um, physics engine. So let's reload this now with our super low density car and see how it behaves. All right, good. Rock solid when it lands, no deviation in the body. And it moves along promptly and it's just behaving very nicely as far as what I want it to do. All right, so. Uh, I set linear damping to 0 0.5, and the reason I did that was because I want, when the car moves, if I accelerate and then I stop, I want it to slow down on its own. I mean, clearly it hit the ramp there, but if I just give it a little spin there, I want it to slow down. Now, if I had the linear damping as 0, and uh, just checking, I have no linear damping on the tires, and then I reload this and run it. A little spin, let go, and it's just not going to slow down until it hits the ramp. No slowing down whatsoever until it hits the ramp. Now, there is actually a little bit slowing going on there, but it's, it's kind of goofy looking. Now, the reason we're getting some slowing is because the tires have angular damping, which means that they want to stop spinning, and there is friction between the tires and the platform, so that will translate into... The platform, in a sense, if the car is moving to the right, the platform friction is pushing on this tire, and the tire wants to slow down, which translates into torque on the axis, and that slows the car down. If I set the angular damping on the tires to zero, and I re-ran this, and give it a little push, it's not going to slow down until it goes up the ramp. In fact, if I had the patience, I could just sit here and it would probably just keep going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and never slow down. So it's almost like a frictionless... Yeah, this is a completely frictionless environment now. Uh, there's friction, but there's no... The friction has no effect. There's no ah. torque, there's no force being applied to the body, so the momentum is retained and it just keeps going back and forth, as we see here, which is not what I wanted. What I wanted was my car to behave more naturally. And you can see in the video that it really looks lurchy, but it looks a little bit lurchy in reality too. So that's telling me that the engine's probably having some issues with this and, and wants 
a little more reasonable values. So I'm going to go back to having a little damping. I guess in a nutshell, a little bit of damping is always good for a physics plotting because it makes it behave more naturally, I think. Okay, the other thing was, is uh, we talked about this, is sleeping allowed is set to false, and the reason I did that is because if I set it to true, and uh, let's take a quick look here, this may still not apply, yeah, so I set it to true, the body went to sleep, I turned on the gravity, nothing happened, because the, the physics engine is saying, I'm done, I, I stopped looking at that uh, 30 seconds ago, or Half a half a second ago, so nothing important is going on. Just leave it alone. Now, if you were to spin a wheel, it would wake up, correct? Yes, yeah. it would wake up. Let's see, spin a wheel. Yeah. yeah. The wheel wakes up. The wheel is attached to the body. It falls. But I didn't want that behavior, so don't allow the body to sleep. Now, when I turn on my gravity, it falls right away. Okay, so that was our chassis. Just just a box, something to mount our tires to. Let's do the left wheel, and then we'll go look at the functions for driving the car, because the right wheel is exactly the opposite, except the other calculation, the other side of the calculation. So what I want to do is I want to place my tires a specific distance from the center of the object to the left or to the right, and a specific distance from the center of the object downward, so that it has this nice alignment with the bottom of the car. And the way I do that is I simply say get the X position of the chassis, which is the center of the rectangle, and subtract half of the width, and then that'll move it all the way to the edge, the left edge, and then I add 15 pixels, or I could add, let's say, 30 pixels, just to see what happens, and that's going to push the tire back more to the right, then the same thing for the Y position. I get the chassis Y. Again, that's in the center of the vehicle, center of the rectangle. And then I simply subtract, or I'm, I add half of the height, and that's going to push it down, so it's going to give it a nice centering exactly uh, at the bottom. But let's just go ahead and, for, for fun, let's push that down an additional 20 pixels. And let's rerun this. So this time we moved it more to the right and more down. So this tire should be somewhere goofy down here. There it is. So we, we push it more right and more down. And now we've got a drag car. It's awesome. So very simple placement. Uh, and then I, what I do is I create a new image rect. And I use the Corona logo, which is this image right here. As we see, if we zoom way in, it's nothing more than a circular image, and it's got some um, transparent segments. And then what I do is I make it 24 pixels wide and 24 pixels tall. I'm going to make that 48 now to start scaling up relative to my car. So I'm making it twice as wide. And then I place it in the wheel X, wheel Y position that I calculated. I add a body to the wheel. I make it very low density, again, because I don't want the mass of the wheel to influence the, the, uh, the motion so much. I use my, my magical filters to say, don't touch, do not respond to collisions with the body. I set the friction really high. Now, I could have set this friction to 1. We'll do that. And then, this is the critical part. Although the image itself is square, what I want is I want a body that is round. So I set a radius of 12. However, I made it bigger. So the radius now has to be half of the width or height because it's a square. So let's make it 24. And at this point, let me rerun it so you can see what's going to happen. I made the tire bigger. I made the radius greater. And now with our offset, it looks better. Not exactly great. Uh, let's go ahead, and I'm going to take this. I really don't like that offset, so I'm going to put that back. So the vertical offset is now going to be aligned with the bottom of the car. Chassis, that is. Uh, no linear damping. In other words, the tire, no matter what direction it moves in a straight line, it's not going to slow down on its own. However, 
I want it to damp when it's rotating. So if I were to give it some angular velocity, I want it to slowly bleed off. So I set the damping to 1. I could have made it more. And I'll show you what happens if we do that. And then, last step, I mount it to the chassis by adding a physics joint using the pivot. The first argument is the left wheel. It's the thing that I want to mount onto the chassis, which is the second argument. And then, for simplicity's sake, I want to make that joint in the center of where the wheel is at. So I could have just said uh, LX and fill Y. That would have worked too. But when I was coding this, I chose to just simply extract the current X and Y position of the left wheel. Let's do that again. Uh, you'll recall that I changed the friction. I'm going to go quickly make the, um, the rest of the code on the other tire match, just so we don't have a lopsided vehicle anymore. All right. And I think that was pretty much it. We'll leave the friction, take that friction down to 1 also. Let's rerun it. Okay, so now our car is bigger. Hey, we fixed the problem we had at the beginning of the Hangout. Uh, I'll turn the gravity on. Everything looks good. But lo and behold, I set the, gr the friction down to one, and now I get a bur I, it's burning out. You know, it's it's cool, it looks good, I kind of like it, but uh, it's not really the behavior that I want. So I'm going to set the, the friction way up again, and this is just going to make it real strong. It's going to increase the intensity of the reaction between these two, so that when I reload this, did I save it? Yes. And turn gravity on, spin the wheel. Okay, whoa, hey, 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 get back. Okay, and we lose it. So, let's see. Uh, angular damping, we talked about that. Okay, so we did the right wheel. The right wheel is basically the mirror opposite. The only difference in this code is that I basically added the content width and subtracted the 30 so that it would be nicely centered over there. What is left? Let's do one of the wheel spinning methods and we will be done. People should be able to understand how this works. So the, the easiest way for me to do this was to treat this whole thing as one super body. And I don't mean in a physics sense. What I mean is a complex object where the chassis knows about the wheels and the joints and it has a function to turn on the left spinning wheel and the right spinning wheel. By doing that, waving my hands around like you can see me, it makes it easier for us to return just a reference to the chassis and then later on in our code simply call a method on the, the, the chassis, which I stored in this variable called car, and say set the left wheel speed to a thousand, which means make that left wheel spin to the left at a thousand revolutions per second, or a thousand degrees per second. And so it just makes it uh, easier for us to manipulate this and use this in our game later instead of having to like reach in and say, where's the tire, set the tire speed. No, I've just got a helper function that does the work for me. So my left wheel uh, spinning helper function, I say function uh, chassis, which is the object that I created above right here. Where is it? the chassis, dot, and then the name of the function. The first argument is a variable which I am naming self. I could call it anything I want, as long as it's a valid Lua variable name. The second argument is the speed. And then within the code, I simply say, if the wheel speed is zero, do this. If it's something else, do this. Now, the zero clearly means stop spinning the tire. So then, you will have noticed when I created the axles, which is what I'm calling the joints, I created a joint and I stored it in the left axle, a variable called left axle on the chassis, and the right wheel joint I stored in a right axle, could have called it anything, variable, on the chassis. So that later on, I could just refer to the left and right axles to get the joint. So what I want to do to spin the left tire is to reach into the object self, which is this chassis, grab the left axle variable, 
which is going to refer to the joint, and then I want to set the parameter max motor torque to zero, which is telling it this axle no longer has any torque value whatsoever. It's now completely possible to spin this. It won't fight back. It won't try to stop the rotation on its own other than what the damping does. I then also disable the motor, which tells the physics engine again, if an external force spins this tire, don't try to stop spinning the tire. Don't have a uh, motor calculation going on. And lastly, I set the motor speed to zero. Now really, all I really needed to do in here was probably set motor enabled to false. But I like to just be safe. It's just a couple of extra steps. So I set the torque to zero, the speed to zero, and I disabled the motor itself. In a nutshell, what that's saying is the joint is now back to being just a regular pivot joint with no active motor engagement. It's not going to try to spin the pivot, which is not going to spin the wheel. However, if the speed were non-zero, I would set... Uh, well, that's just genius. Okay, no, okay, yeah. I would set the max torque to something really high. Now, if this was weak, what would happen is, is that a weak torque, if the body you're trying to spin has a high mass, the torque is, it's not going to be able to spin that mass. So in general what I do is I set the torque really high so that I know that it's going to have no problem spinning the body. In a nutshell, for people who are listening, if you're trying to set torque on a pivot joint and the body is not responding the way you think it should, it's not turning well, just keep cranking up the torque. You can make this thing really high. You can make it a million, ten million. The higher you make it, the stronger the motor is. It has nothing to do with the speed other than its ability to achieve that rotational speed that you're trying to get. Weak torque equals weak spin. Um, the next thing you want to do is you want to... These are all going to get applied at the same time. Really, if I was doing this logically, I suppose I could have said... Do it in yeah, I was going to ask you if there was a particular order that you'd like to put those things in. Yeah, in this case it really isn't, but just I should do it just to make it logically more acceptable. Sorry, two seconds. So for people watching and listening, what I've done here is I've uh, just waited until the very last line of code to enable or disable the motor. So I set the values first, and then I enable it. In reality, these are all going to get applied in the same... Uh, moment of frozen time and so they don't actually get paid attention to until the next phase, the next uh, the next step and so it doesn't matter what order I set them in. Um, so I set the torque high, I set the wheel speed to whatever was passed in which for the left wheel is going to be 1000 uh, degrees per second <clears throat> and then where is it, sorry I set motor enabled to true. In other words, start spinning. And so, load it up just one more time. We click the left wheel button. That will call the callback using our little easy button code. That callback, which is on left, will reach into the car, which was visible from above. It will set the left wheel speed to either 1000 or 0, and the left wheel will spin or stop trying to spin. It'll continue to spin under friction, but the motor will no longer be engaged. Similarly, we do the same thing with the right button, and it spins. Hey, 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 hey. It spins. Okay, stop it. And uh, that's it. You got a simple car. Nice. nice. See, now I, yeah, I, I say we take, we take uh, 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 parallax. parallax. Right, and, right. and feeding in your uh, building your platform, and then we turn it into uh, what was an it? Endless runner car game. Yeah, an endless runner car game with the hills and stuff like that, and and, and uh, all along the way you're you're catching stuff that falls from the sky, and then your goal is, I guess, to reach. The I was working on this vehicle, and I had ten game ideas pop out of my head. This is the problem with working on anything. I get ideas, I get distracted, yeah. I write notes. Like I See, I, got, I like your little your little uh, scoop there right now. It's reminding me of uh, Skate or Die. You all remember that old game? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, I do. There was a uh, there was a 
uh, I think it was I think it was joust. It was a, j- a skateboarding joust competition. You know, it looked a little bit like that. Not with no gravity. That's a that's a new. <laughs> Ooh, check it out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, right, think, so I think I think the things that fall from the sky. One of them is a you know a magic coin that that makes the gravity go away. And so if you, so, there's some things you want to catch and some things you don't. Right. Or maybe yeah. you want to turn gravity off. Name for jump. <laughs> right. Right. So that could be the challenge. Exactly. All right. Well, that's that's excellent. So we will put a link in the show notes so that people can go download the code for that and Ed explained the sampler. So there you go. If you don't. Yeah, so uh, today's sample is going to come out looking just like it did in the show, but uh, it's very likely that I'll make an update with a button to click to download the exact code and just download it right to your hard drive, and you can just look at that, and you don't have to worry about the sample at all. I mean, clearly you still got to download it to run it, but we'll work out the details. Just just implant it right in your brain. I can only do so much. (laughs) Well, you've done a lot, and we appreciate it, so... Uh, so yeah, we'll have a link in the show notes to that. I also want to remind everybody that we are still playing uh, alone mm. and or uh, one dot one target for the chance to win a fifty dollar gift card. So this is the last week to do that. We will we will announce the winner next Monday on July sixth. Uh, so yeah, so <laughs> I, I, you know, on Facebook, uh, it kind of buries that all that on the side. Mm-hmm. So if you go and you look at the post to the page, you guys can can find that stuff. I try to bring that stuff up to the top, but um, sometimes I forget. But if you just go to facebook.com uh, slash coronageek and submit a screenshot of your high score, then that will enter you for the chance to win a $50 gift card. So this is the last week to do that, so go ahead and do that now. And yeah, and Jason and uh, Ed and a few other people are going head-to-head at it over there, so... I think Jason's trying to, to no grab challenge for Jason. He's killing me. Uh, I had one really good game a couple weeks ago. I've played it a few times since then, and I can't come anywhere close. Only I, know. Takes one. I know. It's like the more I play it, the worse I get sometimes. It's like that one fresh <laughs> round, and then after that, I'm Every now and again, I tell myself, I go, I go you know, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to play one game. I'm just going to see how it goes. Because you end up getting into that cycle of like, oh, one more, one more, which is the mark of a good game, which is why I think you know the guys at Laser Dog are talented designers because they've perfected that. But inevitably, it's like diminishing returns. Or, I was going to say, or an addictive personality, one of the two. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to go off the Uh, ace now. uh... (laughs) Also, uh, next week, I've got to to check with Stephen, but uh, Stephen Johnson's going to talk to us about shaders, I think. He sort of pseudo said that he would do that in the last Hangout, so we'll see. Uh, I, I know that he wants to. Um, I just don't know if he's had enough time to put his material together. So hopefully we'll talk about shaders next time. But if not, we'll pull a rabbit out of the hat somehow. So we'll talk about something else. So, all right. That's it for this week. Thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, tuning in and creating apps using Chrome SDK. Until next week, have a great week and happy coding. Cheers.